Hi, I'm Leora Lowenthal. I'm here to talk to you about living with cutaneous lymphoma. And I do want to emphasize that this is about living with cutaneous lymphoma. So there are a lot of different reactions you may have. Uh, common reactions include what I think of as the dark and the light. So in the dark, you might have uh, feeling alone, feeling depressed, frightened, perhaps not feeling understood, or ashamed, overwhelmed. But the light is when you now feel relieved, maybe, because you finally know what is happening. Somebody has finally given you the feeling that they understand what is happening. You might be able to get support. You might feel hopeful because you know how you are going to approach this, or you're going to find out how you're going to approach it. And you may feel inspired. Much of what we're going to talk about today is how your task is to manage the dark. And I like to think of it as invite in the light. It doesn't always come naturally to some people, but find it. So getting started, uh, I always suggest first just to think about the practical details. And that will start with choosing a care team, which is not such a straightforward matter for somebody with a rare diagnosis like cutaneous lymphoma. So first and foremost, you want to find people that actually understand your diagnosis. And the word expert is a complicated one. Lots of people are experts in different things. But really, you want someone who's familiar with this, who knows what it is, and who feels comfortable directing you. I think the other thing you want to consider is the style of the person you're working with. Uh, we all look for different things in care providers. Some of us want someone who is very straightforward, who will tell us everything we ever wanted to know. Some of us want someone who's going to be a little bit more subtle in their approach and and sort of only answer our questions and be comfortable with uh, being the keeper of much of the knowledge for us. Um, also, choosing a team that is accessible to you. And by that I mean people that you can afford to see and people that you can actually get to because it's going to be more than one appointment most times. This is something that, again, as we're going to talk about today, you're going to be living with. And so you want a team that you are going to be working with for a long time, hopefully. Secondly, I would suggest getting familiar with your own insurance coverage. That is actually harder than it sounds. If anyone has ever tried to read their own book of benefits, it can be confusing. Understanding the difference between what a benefit is and what you might be eligible for is very confusing. But it's really important. You're about to rely on your insurance a lot. and. Even if it's something like uh, you're choosing next year's plan and you want to understand what medications you might be entitled to, what's going to be covered in this plan, that involves being familiar both with your insurance and what your team might be recommending for you. You're going to want to look at the financial implications of all of this. And unfortunately, there are many. Uh, with insurance, there are co-pays and deductibles. Learn to understand the difference. Uh, that's partly so that when you get a bill, it doesn't read like something that is written in a language you don't speak. Um, you can get comfortable and learn how to speak medical billing. It just, it's, it's a little intimidating at first. Uh, thinking about what it's going to cost you to go to and from treatment. Let's say you're doing UV treatment three times a week and it's 45 minutes away. Well, how are you going to get there? And what is the gas going to cost? And um, thinking about things like this is also going to help you later when you're thinking about what resources you might need, uh, what kind of support. And during this presentation, one of the things that will be included are lists of places where you can reach out for help finding resources like this. Then there's the obvious learning about your diagnosis and your treatment. I am personally a believer in arming yourself with knowledge. The way I like to approach everything is with understanding. And then I want to go to the people caring for me and say, tell me more. But I, I want to learn as much as possible about what I'm up against. Um, that's another thing we're going to talk about is where to find that information. And there are lots of places, particularly now with the internet, it's easy to find 
any number of websites that will provide you with information. You have to think about whether or not the website you're using is providing reliable and uh, vetted information, information that is really based on uh, the, the knowledge that we have from the medical community and, and also, hopefully, knowledge that we have from patients and caregivers who have already lived through this. And, and lastly, again, I think the question of where and how to find resources is one where you're going to probably need help. And I, I support very much that people look for somebody like a, a social worker or a nurse or some sort of counselor who might be able to guide them to where to look, even something as simple as knowing which booklet to take off the shelf when you're at your doctor's office and you see a wall of, of booklets and you're not sure which one applies to you or might apply to you, stop and ask someone. So when you're meeting a new doctor, and you may meet many new doctors, one of the important things is to think about what are you going to bring with you? And I, I say this not just as a practical list, but to think about the fact that you have to teach your doctor about you. You can never assume walking in that you are somehow coming in with a, you know, a big poster board on your chest that tells them everything they need to know. And you are a part, and an incredibly important part, of your own care team. So this is going to include bringing information to the doctor, for instance, about who are your other doctors? Who do you see? Why do you see them? Is it a cardiologist? Is it an internist? How can they be contacted? Because there may be a, a need for these doctors to speak to one another. If you have uh, information about all other current medical conditions you might have, bring those as well. Cutaneous lymphoma it does not happen in a void. It happens in your body. So everything else happening in your body is going to be relevant. And it may be relevant when you're choosing the best treatment options for you. Uh, bring information about your family history. That doesn't mean that your family history, if you had somebody in your family with cancer, it doesn't mean that that is the reason that you're here with this. But family history, every once in a while, gives small insights into uh, what your background is medically. And it also may tell the, the care team a little bit more about what you've experienced. And I think a, a, an example there is um, sharing, for instance, that you had a parent who died 20 years earlier of cancer. Well, that tells your doctor something about what your experience of cancer may be and, and what you may have seen. And it may be very different than what you're going to be experiencing now. It probably is if it's been 20 years. Uh, I think also the names and contact information for any friends and family that you want involved in your care. That's really very important. You have patient rights that protect your privacy. You want your doctor to know who can they speak to other than you. Uh, if you are like many people, you have people who love you who will call your doctor and say, I need to know what's going on. Or, oh, well, she came home and she wouldn't tell me anything, so please explain to me what happened in the appointment. Your doctor is going to need to know who can they speak to, who do they have permission to speak to. And I would strongly suggest that you try to have one primary contact person uh, just to keep things from getting confusing so that if it's not you, let's say there's someone else that they're allowed to speak to either with test results or with information about appointments, choose that one person. You don't want to have five different people managing your health care uh, for your sake as well as for the sake of your team. Lastly, but I think this is very important, if you have completed advanced directives, bring a copy of those to your doctor. Advanced directives, for anyone who doesn't know, are documents where you can essentially say what your preferences are regarding your health care should there ever be a time when you're not able to share those yourself. And that doesn't have to be because of cutaneous lymphoma. Uh, this is, always sounds dark to say, but 
Now you can have cutaneous lymphoma and uh, unfortunately be in a car accident and unable to speak for yourself when you get to an emergency room. So in that moment, an advanced directive may be something like a healthcare proxy that says who you have assigned as your agent, the person who you think best understands your preferences, your wishes, and that person is going to be able to speak for you. So I, I always say to people, embrace advanced directives because they're your right and they're there to help you. So uh, things to bring with you uh, should also include a list of your current medications. And this is something I think not just to bring with you to your first appointment, but carry that with you. Uh, that's just a good thing to have. Knowing your medications, knowing your dosages, what your schedule is, that's always important. And I'm going to include in that uh, anything that you may be taking that is a supplement or a vitamin, even if it says all natural and you got it at the farm down the street and it was made by your Aunt Mary, all natural can still interact with drugs, with any treatment that you're doing. At the end of the day, everything starts as all natural. It's, it's just us that messes with it. Um, so bring that information. Also consider the way I like to think about any kind of integrative or complementary care. If you're using something because you believe it can help you, you should consider the possibility that anything that has the power to help you may also have the power to harm you. And again, you want to make sure just to share these things with your doctor. This is somebody you're now working with together as a team. They need to know everything you're putting into this body that they are gonna work with you to take such good care of. Uh, also, always important, know your allergies and bring a list of those as well because you're gonna be asked for them. There are some things that I like to think of as uh, communication helpers. And the first was, is to actually think about what your questions are before you go into an appointment. So think about the questions, have them ready, have them organized, and, and maybe even write them down. If you know what your questions are or you know that you have questions, let your doctor know that you, you have some questions and that you would like to schedule some time to be able to talk about them. That's a nice thing to have in advance is the time that's put aside just a little bit to focus just on, on whatever these questions may be. Think about whether or not you understand the terminology that your doctor is using, and if you don't, ask. I think it's important to remember that not everyone is equally comfortable with some of this language and for you it may be the first time you're hearing many of the phrases that you may become very comfortable with but it's more important that you understand than that you uh, act like you understand. It's not going to actually upset anyone if you say you don't understand and it's going to help you if you then later do. Uh, I would also encourage you to tell your doctor if you are in any way uncomfortable or scared of having a physical exam. One of the things about uh, exams for cutaneous lymphoma is that often they're, uh, they're revealing. You are frequently stripping down and you, you may be having multiple people looking at you in your underclothing, at really something that not everyone is comfortable with and there are lots of different reasons that people may be uncomfortable being examined by a doctor. That's okay too, but let your doctor know. And I think first and foremost, remember that your doctor, your care team, none of them are mind readers and they want to understand what your concerns are. They want to understand what your needs are. The best way for that to happen is for you to share it with them and, and to trust them. So another thing you're gonna be talking about with your physician is whenever you're starting a new medication or treatment. And I think there's some things to think about in making sure that you understand what that's going to uh, involve. So first of all, do you understand what this medication or treatment might do for you? Uh, do you understand how it works? Do you understand how quickly it might work? Uh, many things will not work overnight, and so understanding what a, at least an average time frame is could be helpful. I think also understanding if this medication is helping you, how are you going to know 
what's that going to look like? What's that going to feel like? And if it's not, how are you going to know? When should you be reporting back to your doctor? That's to think about keeping them always in the loop about what is happening for you. I think another question to think about is uh, how long you might be doing this treatment or medication. One of the things with cutaneous lymphoma is that for most people, this is a chronic illness. That means you could be starting a treatment for an indefinite amount of time. You might be starting UVB therapy and doing it for the next 10 to 20 years. You might be doing something for the next month. But, but knowing what you're looking ahead towards can be helpful, sometimes scary, but also I think quite helpful and important. And as part of that, you want to make sure that you have talked to your doctors about the goals of care and understanding risks for any medication or treatment, benefits, of course, and also any possible alternatives. It might be comforting to know going into this. Is this the best choice for me? And if for any reason I don't feel that this is what I want to do, what are my alternatives? Or if this doesn't work the way we hope it does, what might the next steps be? I talk about goals of care because I think, again, this is a chronic illness and there are a lot of different ways to try to treat it. You are going to try to maintain the best quality of life you can possibly have. And that looks different for different people. It's different things are a, a young adult may be very concerned with fertility, an older adult may be less concerned with fertility, may really want to make sure that they can still go golfing every Sunday. And, and those may not sound comparable, but for some people, uh, they are. It's, uh, it's, it's whatever is very important to you in that moment and making sure that this treatment is going to work for you in that context. One trick I like to suggest to people to make sure that you really understand what your doctor has said to you, or anyone in your care team, of course, repeat back what you think you've understood. So your doctor has just explained what is going to happen when you start a treatment. So you might want to say, OK, so let me just repeat this back to you. Let me know if I'm misunderstanding it. And you can use your own language, but that's a great way to make sure that you actually understand what has just been explained to you. I think also writing things down, and if possible, getting written reports of your tests, of your test results, of your notes, whatever it may be, instructions about self-care at home. Take these things, make yourself a binder. If you want to make it a fun binder, make it a fun binder, but have your information where you're going to be able to find it. And I, that should include things even like maybe a chapter for your bills. Uh, I, I personally have a habit of uh, receiving a bill, throwing it on the floor, which is very inconvenient when I actually need to find that bill. So I, I'm trying to teach myself to actually follow this rule of uh, make a binder, know where to find it, and then also know your rights. You have a right to your own medical records and information about your own care. If you're having any trouble accessing that, find out where to get help. Uh, there is often, at least in hospitals and doctor's offices, often a patient advocate, somebody who can talk to you about how to make sure you are getting the information you need. Uh, my assumption is that most people will not have difficulty with this, but it never hurts to ask for help when you need it. Another thing that's going to be very important to talk to your doctor and your care team about are symptoms and side effects and keeping them informed. Now, symptoms and side effects, uh, I think, are one of the most confusing things for anyone to, to really sort out. Not just intellectually confusing, but literally confusing for us to understand what's going on. First, I would say to think about the difference between a symptom and a side effect. They can be physical, they can be emotional. A symptom is something that you experience because of your underlying condition. So I would say as a good example, a stomach pain may be a symptom of stomach flu. A side effect is usually something that occurs 
because of a medication or a treatment that you're doing. And a good example of a side effect in this case would be your stomach pain may be a side effect of this medication that you took this morning. Thinking about how to differentiate between those will be helpful for you when you're trying to understand how to manage your treatment. Distinguishing between symptoms and side effects is increasingly confusing when you start adding in multiple medications and or multiple underlying conditions. I think one of the ones that I like to use as the best example of this and a very common example is fatigue. Figuring out what is causing fatigue is one of the trickiest things I've personally ever tried to do. So you, you notice that you're very tired, unusually tired, and your first thought might be, well, this is a side effect. But before you think that, I would suggest looking more carefully at your schedule and perhaps even keeping track, uh, starting a journal for yourself where you look at what else might have changed. And fatigue, for instance, can be a symptom of depression. It could be the result of new insomnia that you're experiencing because you're feeling stressed out. It could be the result of changes in your daily life and your activities. So perhaps you always went to the gym at lunchtime, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and now instead of the gym, you're off to UV or a Targretin session, whatever it may be, something in your life may be changing that is contributing to this feeling, and it's tempting to want to blame everything you feel on this new diagnosis, tempting in a scary way. But try to remember that this is just one thing happening in your body, and there's all other ways in which uh, you can feel tired, feel ill, feel great, all other reasons. So keep track and do your best to communicate with your team about this. If you're noticing something changing, something new, let your doctor know. And, and don't think along the lines, I've heard many people say, I don't want to bother them with this information. It's not important. Well, you're important. So everything that's happening to you is important. I think uh, also it's a really good example of why you and your doctor have to work as a team, and you can be a fantastic team. Your doctor knows most of the usual experiences, so they've seen many people with your diagnosis, with the medications you take. They know the average experience, but you know you. You know what your average is. You know your own baselines. You know your life day to day. And without that information, there is no complete picture. So partner with your doctor. Make this a team effort to get to your best health. I like to call this slide getting comfortable in your skin because I like the expression and I think it's very suitable for anyone living with or affected by cutaneous lymphoma. If your symptoms or side effects are visible, so for instance, if you have visible patches, you've been doing UV treatment, and you have a fantastic tan, full body, but only from the neck down, things that other people might notice and ask about, be prepared for possible questions. And think a little bit in advance about what you might want to say if you're asked those questions. Do you want to be uh, fully honest about what's going on? And if so, that's great. If not, that's great. But it might be nicer for you to have a sense of what you want to do before you get to that moment. I also think it's, it's really important to remember that people rarely know exactly what to say or exactly what you need that is going to feel like the right thing, uh, if there is a right thing, which I'm pretty sure there's not, but but there's usually a writer thing. Um, and lots of times people who love you very much, who want very much to support you, they're going to miss the boat on saying the right thing at that first moment. And in those moments, I think it might be helpful to try to think back to remind yourself of that, that moment when you first heard about your diagnosis and the shock and the confusion and and maybe the misunderstandings you had about what this means. So remember, this other person, for them, this is new. They may be scared. 
They may be uh, simply worried about you. Whatever it is, uh, prepare yourself and then give them a chance to also learn a little bit about what you need from them. You're going to have to talk to your friends about that, by the way, but that's, uh, it's worthwhile, I think. If you're in a new relationship, uh, for instance, you've just started dating someone, you really like them, and you're thinking, well, we're going on our first date, and uh, at what point in the date should I announce this? Should I do it during appetizers? Uh, should I do it uh, during dessert when, you know, maybe the evening has gone by? Well, maybe not on the first date. Uh, what I would suggest in general is, well, it's going to be very important to share what's happening in your life. You, you do want to feel safe. You want to feel like you can trust this person a little bit before you share something that may still feel extremely personal and private to you. So that's just something to consider. And everybody finds their own, again, their own right pace and right schedule. But it's worth considering before you're in the moment. Uh, if you're already in, a physically intimate relationship. There are different concerns, and those can include things, uh, concerns I mean in terms of communication. Presumably, this other person already knows what's going on. But what they may not know is the way in which your diagnosis or your treatment may be changing your needs. It may be something like body image, that you are feeling uh, less attractive. Perhaps you're feeling self-conscious when you take your clothes off and there are scars or patches or something. There may also be things that affect your comfort and your ability to be sexually intimate. So some medications uh, may impact a man's ability to maintain an erection. It may impact a woman's ability to lubricate. It may be painful for you to have very close contact in certain areas of your body that are very sensitive. So all of these things, I strongly suggest, again, try honesty, try sharing, because they won't get better by staying secret. And there are many, many ways to be intimate and loving and share with people that that might be able to work around some of that. Uh, the other thing is that with some of these matters, I do suggest talking to your healthcare providers. Uh, I have noticed personally, people tend to be very shy, as though somehow you have a cancer diagnosis, why should you talk about something so frivolous as your body image or sex? Those are not frivolous things, those are important. They're part of how we express ourselves, they're part of how we express love. Talk to your doctors, your nurses, your social workers, they will understand this and hopefully will be able to help and support you. Given my background in oncology social work, I am a great believer in focusing on your emotional well-being. And what I mean by that is pay attention to how you're responding to all of this. In, in the midst of all of this chaos, you may actually forget to pay attention to that, but how is your emotional well-being? Are you feeling anxious? Are you feeling depressed? And do you need to talk to someone? Maybe medication would help you. There are a lot of resources and a lot of people available that you can bring onto your care team. And that might include a social worker, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, it may be a chaplain. There are any number of different people and professionals that you can reach out to. But what I think is most important is thinking about what's going on for you and who might be able to be a good starting point. Maybe they won't be the person you end up working with, but they'll help you figure out what you need. Often these resources are actually available through a medical center if you're going to a doctor's office that's affiliated with a hospital. Uh, I also strongly suggest that you look at how to use and build upon your own coping skills. You have them. We all have them. And that's partly because we've all had things we have to cope with before this diagnosis comes along. In moments of panic or stress, it's really easy to forget that you have your own arsenal of tools that already lives within you, but you do. So you just have to take a little time to find those.
One of the slides I like to include is called The Tyranny of Positive Thinking. And that is not my term. It is a term that was coined by Drs. Jimmy Holland and Sheldon Lewis, who wrote a wonderful book called The Human Side of Cancer. And in that book, they include something called The Dogma of the Don'ts. So this is, you don't have to be cheerful all the time. You don't have to see every silver lining and bright side. And you don't have to see cancer as a gift. And what I most appreciate about that message is that I think actually there is often tremendous pressure on people to have a positive attitude, to smile in the face of cancer, to say, if you keep a positive attitude, you keep a smile on your face, you will be fine. But there is a flip side to that, which is, somehow that message can become, well, you didn't get better because you had a bad attitude, which is probably not actually what's going on. I think that this is legitimately stressful. And what science supports is that you didn't get better because perhaps the treatment you were using wasn't quite the right one. And that is hard to be positive in the face of. And it's okay to have days where you feel lousy or days where you do not see this as a gift. I think having a positive attitude, seeing things as a gift, looking for silver linings is a wonderful thing. And, and it will be, for you, perhaps more enjoyable. But it shouldn't feel like something that you absolutely have to do. So something that can be helpful is thinking about how to identify unusual stress levels within yourself and what that might look like. Sadness, frequent crying, feeling anxious, having changes in your sleep, having changes in your appetite, either eating more or less, maybe difficulty concentrating or forgetfulness. And, and these may all be things that are normal for you in certain amounts. But the way I would think about whether you need help is Think about the question of how much are these experiences, this stress, interfering with your day-to-day -day life? Is it stopping you from living your life the way you want to be living it? The question becomes, what can you do for yourself uh, in addition to asking others for help? Well, each of us have a unique coping style. And the first thing I would recommend is think about what has worked for you in the past in times of stress. Are you a planner? Are you somebody who needs to consider every possible eventuality and be prepared for it? Are you someone that just needs to focus on the moment? Is there a goal you can set for yourself for managing your stress and try to stick to it, but make it realistic? Don't plan by the end of the week you won't cry ever again. That's probably not realistic. I think the way to imagine this is that managing your stress doesn't mean that you won't have any stress. It doesn't mean that you can make it all go away. It means that you can limit the amount that it interferes with your life. One of the things I believe is most important in just about every challenging moment in life is human companionship and connection. So keep your friends close. Let people stay connected to you. It doesn't mean you have to share every moment of this but don't isolate yourself. Make plans with people, and if you're worried you're not gonna feel up to it, you can cancel, they'll forgive you. And if you are willing to, invite someone to come to your appointments with you. One of the things that I have myself experienced is that in a stressful doctor's appointment, no matter how prepared you think you are and how much you understand exactly how to write things down and listen closely, when you're stressed, you forget things. And having someone there with you really can be a wonderfully helpful thing. If you're part of a community, consider if there's a way that that community can offer you some support. Perhaps your church, perhaps uh, a book group that you go to. Whatever it is, just look at that as a resource. And, and consider, again, resources like counselors, social workers, chaplains, professional groups, networks, whatever it is that you need, but connect to other people. So just a few tips about sharing and disclosure. Uh, I think what's important is when you're talking to your family and friends, 
That's the moment when you can usually prioritize your own needs. Uh, you can explain to them what you may or may not be ready to share. And I don't mean that their needs don't count. I just mean you can really focus on what's comfortable for you. With children and adolescents, it's very important to consider, uh, first of all, being honest whenever possible, because children pick up on and hear much more than we tend to think. They overhear conversations, they pick up on moods. They will sometimes be frightened of what they don't understand. And the other thing is, you may want to talk to someone or um, there are many resources online or books that advise on this about how to talk to your child about illnesses based on their developmental stage. What children can understand and respond to is very different based on where they are developmentally. And you can get some great suggestions on language to use and how to approach this. When you're sharing with employers, uh, clients, or colleagues, I always recommend uh, proceeding with caution. And that's simply because it's your workplace and you want to understand what your benefits are and what your concerns may be about sharing this information in a professional setting. And you may choose to share with everyone or with no one, but whatever it is, I, I simply suggest that you take a moment first to think and make sure that you are uh, familiar with what your options are going to be. I'm also a great believer in finding peer support and by that I mean uh, your peers in every sense. So not just your peers, your friends, your classmates, your um, workmates, but also your peers in the world of cutaneous lymphoma. So consider joining a support group. Uh, that doesn't have to be in person if you can't get to one or you're not comfortable with that. There are many telephone groups. There are online groups and listservs. Uh, you may want to join a buddy program where you have a one-to-one -one connection with somebody who has a diagnosis that is uh, either your same diagnosis or something very similar and a similar experience. You may want to attend patient education events. That's a wonderful place to meet people and be able to sort of quietly be a part of an audience, maybe participate in group sessions. And whether all or none of those appeal to you, I always suggest uh, that you consider getting involved. Get involved with an organization like the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation uh, or any other organization that is supporting and somehow helping people with your diagnosis. Volunteering is something, it's a great way to meet people, it's a great way to learn things, and it can actually help you feel like you are a part of this larger effort to help people like yourself. I think overall, it's a win for everyone. I am also a great believer in letting people help you. So if you need to, Make a list of the people you're most comfortable having help you or uh, take you to appointments or come with you when you're running errands to pick up medications. If you need it organized, have a team leader and they can coordinate with your friends. Communicate as much as possible. Let people know what you need and how you need it. Use perhaps websites like um, Care Pages or Caring Bridge. Uh, these allow you to share information without having to do each individual phone call or email. And most importantly to me, skip past the question of feeling like you're a burden to your loved ones. Because in my experience, loved ones, generally speaking, want so much to help. They're looking for ways to help. They're looking for ways to support you. They can't necessarily cure you or fix what's wrong but you can give them ways to be supportive, and that is a gift. Yeah, so you may be a more private person and not want to share your thoughts with other people, but there are lots of ways to express yourself. Write in a journal, maybe do a blog, create, make art, take up knitting, just find ways to share things. And I personally happen to love the art of talking, so I did throw into this slide just talk, talk, and talk some more. It doesn't even have to be to people. You can talk to your cats. You can talk to a tree. Get things out and express yourself and, and get comfortable with your own feelings.
Look to your own mind and body for really valuable tools of relaxation. So for instance, uh, relaxation techniques like guided imagery, uh, meditation, hypnosis, visualization. Uh, explore your faith and spirituality. I think for many people that's an essential component of this process and a, a really important part of healing. Exercise, yoga, massage, anything that allows you to take care of yourself. Spend time doing what you love. Your hobbies, I, I strongly suggest spending time on your favorite hobbies. And if you can't keep up with your old hobbies right now, find new ones. Uh, as I've noted here, cancer is not a hobby. It can be an interest, it can be a concern and a passion, but that's not like gardening. Also very important, take 10 to 15 minutes a day to do something nice for yourself. Uh, you clearly deserve it, so do it. It's also very important to recognize your own limits and communicate them. If you need to take some time away from thinking about this, away from talking about it, go ahead and do that and, and let the people that need to know know that you need that. You may also want to think about scheduling sometime into your week where you know you're going to be able to worry, where you're going to be able to think about this. Uh, for many people, Therapy or a support group can meet that purpose, where it gives you a block of time, where you really, uh, you know that this is what you can address. You may also want to look at uh, whether or not there is stress in your life that you can eliminate. If there is, I would suggest get rid of it. it there is no need to keep stress around that isn't absolutely necessary. and. I think very important if you think you might benefit from medication for depression, anxiety, anything like that, I like to encourage people to be open to that because we are open to any number of things to help what we think of as our physical health. And your mental health is just as important and it's going to be one of your most important tools really in helping you get through this successfully. You may often hear people talk about finding a new normal, and what they mean by this is that um, people often ask the question, when am I going to feel normal again? When are things going to be normal again? And the answer is that they will be normal again, but they may not be exactly the same. You may have a new normal. You don't have to like this diagnosis, and you don't have to like what it's brought to your life. but. Getting back to a point where you really like your life with this diagnosis in it, that's a great goal and that should be your goal. You are going to create a new normal and it can in fact be and should be a very wonderful one. What we're going to do in the next few slides is show you some lists of resources that I hope will help you with that. This is just a few of the many resources that exist to support people living with cutaneous lymphoma, people affected by cutaneous lymphoma. That includes all our family, friends, loved ones. Take time, look through these. Even if you go to one website, it's going to likely be a wonderful gateway for many others. And if you have questions, ask. Thank you for watching this today. I hope it was helpful, and I wish all of you the greatest of luck in your journey.